I am very pleased that uh, Professor Richard Guy Wilson and Mr. Alexander Gillum could be here with us this afternoon. Um, professor Wilson is a professor of architectural history. I'm not going to read the lengthy list of all of his publications. I did find a copy of uh, some of his publications from the previous backstage class that I did print for you so that you could reference some of his materials. I am not going to, again, talk about all the things that he has written, but one of your must purchases, among other things, of course, is the Guide to the University of Virginia. Um, he is the co-author of the second edition, revised edition. If you've not seen this book, I highly recommend that you pick it up. It is in the bookstore. It is readily available just about everywhere. And of course, he is going to make reference to um, several other texts that he's done and his guide to the university as well and the law. Well, I'm very delighted to be here and um, to give you a sort of brief overview of Jefferson's design of the Academical Village. Uh, as, uh, was, as Steve noted, uh, there is the guidebook there, and then if you're really a bug on this, this is a book done now, I guess it's about four years ago. Uh, we've done two exhibits of Jefferson's drawings uh, for the Academical Village, and uh, this is the University of Virginia uh, Press. And then finally, the last pitch is that if you really like this sort of stuff, um, there will probably be a class offered in the architecture school that's open to the entire university uh, this coming fall that will be on Jefferson as an architect, and you might find that uh, of interest. So anyway, um, the University of Virginia um, is known for many things, as you know. Um, we have great students here, right? Tops. Um, we agree. Okay. Uh, we have faculty too, right? Pretty good faculty. Uh -huh. Great faculty. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, we have a tremendous library, one of uh, the great university libraries. Uh, but then we have something else, and that is the architecture. Now, every university is, in a sense, is unique, and has, or college is unique as far as its architecture goes. But the University of Virginia is something very special. Uh, we are one of the only 18 World Heritage sites. Uh, on the World Heritage List uh, run by uh, United Nations and by UNESCO. We're one of the only eight, uh, 18 uh, here in the United States, uh, which gives a clue to exactly, it gives a clue to, uh, 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 of how it is viewed. Uh, architecturally, of course, it presents many different types of images. And it goes to and another level to one of Jefferson's most important accomplishments. And that is, as he wrote, and this is a quote here uh, that he uh, did in, uh, in a letter uh, back, in, uh, 17, um, uh, back, uh, back in 1789, uh, uh, when he was in Paris, uh, architecture is among the most important arts and it is desirable to introduce taste into an art which shows so much. And he's writing this to different Americans uh, who might be visiting uh, Europe, uh, that this is something that they really ought to pay attention to. He goes on about painting and sculpture, and he says that that's fine, but it's pretty expensive, but it's architecture that you really ought to, that you really ought to focus on. And in other places, he writes, I could go on for a couple of hours here, uh, quoting him about architecture and so forth, but in other places, he writes that, that this is central to our identity, uh, that architecture is what makes people's identity. And by this, and I think that the reference here is obvious, uh, that when you go off to Egypt or you go off to Italy, uh, what is it you go to see? Yes, drink some wine, uh, have a good meal, but especially it's the architecture. The architecture is the sort of permanent record. Yes, we have books, we have memories, but architecture is one of those permanent records. And this is very much, I think, what Jefferson was up to with the University of Virginia. Now, as I've already said, uh, he is uh, an individual of many, many accomplishments. As you know, um, on the left, uh, this is the first known portrait of him. 
Uh, and as you can see, it was painted in 1786 in London by a young American who was over there studying to become an artist. Uh, and they say this is the first known portrait of Jefferson. Notice the date here. This is 10 years after the Declaration of Independence. And just see how much we have changed today. I mean, <laughs> you know, you have pictures instantaneous from birth on. Uh, and yet this is the first known, uh, the first known uh, portrait of him. And what he is in his hands there, he has the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and that figure in the background, that is liberty. Uh, and this is, of course, this is identification of Jefferson as this sort of primary author of uh, the American, uh, of, of the young America. Uh, he also did many, many other things. Uh, he was very interested in the different sciences uh, and botany, biology. Uh, he is maybe the first American archaeologist. He directed a dig on an Indian mound outside of town here. Uh, and that is maybe the first attempt to, to try to get some sort of a history of the earlier people, uh, that's, uh, earlier people that settled this continent. Uh, he was an envoyous reader. He was a philosopher. Of course, he was a politician, as we know. Uh, but what I do think is interesting is the portrait on the right. And this is not the last portrait of him, but it is near the end. And Thomas Sully, the painter of this, came down here to Albemarle County, to Charlottesville, to do a head of Jefferson. Uh, this is to be a sort of a, a row of portraits of the so-called founders. But he was so impressed by what he saw going on across the street over here, the construction of the academical village, that he went back up north and did this, and this is much bigger than what my image is here. It's about a nine foot tall uh, painting. It now hangs up at West Point, at the Military Academy at West Point. And in case you didn't know, Jefferson is also the founder of the Military Academy at West Point. Uh, and it stands up there. But of course, he's aged, as we all do. The color of his hair is different. Uh, he's a little bit more jolly. Uh, his dress is very, very different, which shows the change of fashion over time. But what is the setting? And that big column, I think, is a very apt indication that Jefferson's role as an architect, uh, that the architecture is, some, is architecture that's uh, very important. As I say, Jefferson, many different interests. He liked good wine. Here's a tidbit for you for Thanksgiving dinner with your grandparents. He's the man that introduced French fries into this country. Uh, he discovered palm frits while he was in Paris. He didn't actually bring them back because they had gotten a little moldy coming across the Atlantic. Uh, but he is apparently the first person who had palm frits or French, as we know, as French, uh, uh, as French fries today. Uh, very briefly, a little bit of background because you have to understand the background to understand what went on here uh, at the University of Virginia. He was born a little bit outside of town, east of here, if you go up Pantops Mountain. Uh, and go across the top of the mountain, and instead of getting on 64 and heading off towards Richmond, if you just keep on going down uh, Route 250, about a mile and a half, you'll see a big marker on the side of the road. If you get out of your car, climb over the fence, I didn't say you could do that, but if you climb over the fence there, you can go off into the middle of the field. This photograph here is taken just about on top of the site where Peter Jefferson, his daddy's house, stood. Uh, and what I'm taking a picture of here is this is off in the distance back there. Do we, we yeah. Right up there, that's Monticello, right up there on top of that hill. Uh, and so this is where he was born. Monticello is where he builds the course, and that is where he passes away. Uh, and this is another important element, I think, about uh, Jefferson that he is. As Dumas Malone, one of his great biographers, once said, uh, he was a Virginian all of his life. Uh, that the, the Virginia was something that was very important to him. It's already said that it's up on top of that hill that he begins construction uh, about 1768 uh, of Monticello. Uh, and this is Monticello I. Uh, it was a long process, as you can see from these dates here, uh, 68 to 82, uh, construction of the leveling of the top of the hill. This is the initial Monticello. Now, how many of you have been to Monticello? Those of you haven't, shame on you. We're going in the spring. We're doing a field trip again this year. 
uh, you should go to Monticello. Uh, but anyway, does this look like the Monticello you know? No, no, it doesn't. There's the one we know right there, the back of the nickel, uh, a domed building. Uh, on the left, this is a model that some architecture school students did a few years ago of Monticello I. Uh, he begins construction of this house and then quits in 1782 with the death of his wife, Martha. And he's very, very broken up about that. And then the building lays fallow basically for a number of years. He's off to Paris. Uh, he's in the Washington administration. But then he gets going again, as you can see, in 1796 and tears down a portion of the house, it changes the front from this two-story portico that you have right, right here to this single story, uh, puts a dome on it, vastly expands the house, uh, and, this is the, and this is the Monticello uh, that we know today. Uh, this brings up a very important point about Mr. J. He is obsessed with where he lived. Wherever he moved, even if he didn't own the place, he remodeled it. When he was off in Philly, writing the Declaration of Independence, he remodeled the quarters he was in there. When he was in Paris as the American, what we call today the ambassador, he remodels the quarters there and plants a garden, even though he doesn't own it. Wherever he goes, he remodels. And indeed, Monticello was through almost all of his life under construction. Now, how many of you have lived with your parents through a remodeling of your house? Was that a lot of fun? No. Was it good for a marriage? <laughs> this is a construction zone the entire time. But the point is that this is a person who is very obsessed by what it is, by what it is uh, that he's doing. Now, how did Jefferson learn architecture? And I should point out that we don't have an official school of architecture in this country until after the Civil War when MIT in 1765 founds a school of architecture in Boston. Uh, up to that point in time, the way that people learned architecture was basically you apprenticed with another person who had claimed to be an architect. But back in Jefferson's time, there really weren't anybody around that was an architect. So how did he learn? He learned through books. He had a gigantic library, a gigantic library of probably over 7,000 titles, of which about 6,314 or something like that he sold to Congress and forms the nucleus of the original Library of Congress. In that architectural library, he had more than 40 architectural titles. This is one I'm showing you right here. This is the Italian Renaissance architect, Andrea Palladio, who is probably the most famous and in many ways the most important of the Italian Renaissance architects. This happens to be a book that he loved very much and he owned over the course of his lifetime, we can trace that he owned about 13 different copies of this, different editions. This happens to be an English edition uh, uh, translated by a man by the name of Giacomo or James Leone. As you can see, it was published in London in 1715. The original of this goes back to the 1560s. And it's out of this that he learned the different orders. For instance, here, which of you know your orders here? 